McGee, Mississippi night before last. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Art Green. Uh, we'll be around for the rest of the day. And uh, at this point, I will turn it over to, to our good uh, good friend and, and colleague, uh, David Reed of Dallas, Texas. Uh, the second time David's traveled this far to enlighten us. And, He's got some uh, great tales to tell about what our fellows uh, may have encountered at uh, Chickamauga. Thank you, Art. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm David Wheat, Private, 9th Texas Infantry, Confederate States Army. I've been detached, detailed, here to Grove Hill, Alabama, to march with y'all, with our ancestors, my ancestor, W.D. Gilton, Private, Company K, 38th Alabama. I want to thank everybody who's given my, me and my sweet wife, Dee, just to take a picture of me. Uh, for your hospitality, Will Davis, for helping put this PowerPoint together here to read everyone who had a hand at it. We give you handouts. We're going to be referring to some of those, some maps. Uh, I'm not an expert. Some people want ask me why do you wear the Confederate uniform? I've had people accost me about that. Why are you reenactor? I spent seven years active army, and probably many of y'all in the military. I don't need to play soldier, but I wanted to know what it was like to be a private in the Confederate Empire. Over 15 years now in October, by the way, they promised me that I'm going to get a pension between the United States Service and the Confederate Service. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who sees said it would be $11 a month, I think I ought to get it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm wearing this uniform. I'm going to visit with you about the Battle of Chickamauga. You may ask, why are we going to talk about Chickamauga? Two armies collided, had a little fight, a lot of men got killed, a lot of men got hurt, one side won, one side lost, and everybody left went home. That's all it is, isn't it? Many people's lessons and understanding of history is just about that. There's a lot more to it. How did y'all like the rain last night? We had a pretty good rain, didn't we? Mm. Had a pretty good breakfast, though. <laughs> Do you reckon that the men 38th Alabama Infantry had a roof over their head when they're marching in the field, when the rain pours down, when it gets cold, when it gets hot, when it's miserable, when you're suffering, when there's people, people out there trying to kill you. That's really what it's about. As I speak, I hope that I'm not offended. It was Yankee among us. I wouldn't mind so much spending him. <laughs> but sometimes when people say things that take that out of context, maybe get a little bit of I hope not to do that. You know, how many here have walked the battlefield of Chickamauga? Good. How many have walked the Lookout Mountain Missionary Ridge? When you walk these battlefields, whether you know it, ladies and gentlemen, you're walking on hallowed ground. Even for the Yankees, it's hallowed ground. One of the things that I wanted to do in becoming a reenactor is try and learn a little bit about what was going on. By the way, can y'all hear me back here in the back? Over here? If I tail off and can't talk about it, don't talk about it not someone someone say something. Okay? <clears throat> when you're walking these battle people, I don't think I've ever walked the battlefield yet that I haven't learned something. Maybe I can wreck my wife a little bit, but you know, that's part of the crisis. When you walk these battlefields, if you're quiet, and if you listen, perhaps you'll hear the rattle of musketry. Perhaps you'll hear the roar of cannon. Perhaps you'll see the smoke and smell the smoke of the cannon. You'll hear the men crying, fighting, suffering, dying. But well, that's what happened. What I'd like to do now is 
just visit with you about chicken market. Now I've got a PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully it'll go okay. If we have time, hopefully at the end, if you have any questions, we'll try and address them. You know, one of the things that, that you know, I go back and forth when I'm doing one of these things, or when I'm on a uh, battlefield, whenever I do a reenactment, I get rid of all things modern. So, you wear what they wore, you try to eat what they ate, you sleep on the ground, if it rains, you get wet. If it's cold, you freeze. If it's hot, you sweat. These things are hot, they aren't black for people, so they keep you warm in the winter and okay in the summer. Just that, that way. But I'll be putting my eyeglasses on here in a minute just to be able to read something that uh, some of the men wouldn't have had. Uh, whenever I do reenactment, I know I don't wear my eyeglasses. So we'll go back and forth between modern, modern days and old days. What I want to do now is go back with me. 145 years, September 1863. Chickamauga, 1863. August 1863, Federal Army of the Cumberland under General William Rosecrans moves from Middle Tennessee towards Chattanooga. Now, why is that important? It was a rail town. Okay? We have some reenactors here. Who was at Chickamauga in 99? Who was at Chickamauga in 08? A couple here. You know, and the reason I got volunteered to, to make this presentation, I sent my article to Artie Green, and I said, come talk. You know, when I was at Chickamauga, I had a nice gum blanket. I think some of y'all can see my blanket roll out there. I had a blanket. Uh, I even had a piece of canvas. Uh, we weren't getting shot at. <coughs> and yet I was miserable. In 99 it turned off cold, historically accurate, just like it happened then. And so I thought about the men we're portraying and the events of 1863. Now, why is that important? By, that's by the way, the General Major General William Ross Prince. Okay? Chattanooga was a key railroad center with river access, gateway to the Deep South. 2,500 folks. <coughs> Ross Prince moved to the South. Braxton Bragg. Braxton Bragg. Abandoned Chattanooga in September 1863. Now, General Ross Grant began you know, advancing toward Dalton, Georgia, which that's another reunion story. What he thought was a beaten, retreating army. I got him now, folks. They're running. That's what Ross Grant saw. Y'all heard of the New York Times, New York Herald? They wrote a story about what was really going to happen. Two divisions of General James Longstreet's Corps, Army of Northern Virginia, began a 775-mile train ride to, to get to where Braxton Bragg was. General Davis, General Robert A. Lee had agreed, let's put some men to help Braxton and Bragg and see what we can do, because Ross Grant's army had always outnumbered Bragg Generally, Ross Grant's army had beaten Bragg. Bragg was not well liked by many in, his men, in, in the Army uh, of Tennessee. General James Longstreet. General Bragg posted his army on the west bank of Chickamauga Creek in North Georgia. That, ladies and gentlemen, Chickamauga Creek. This, ladies and gentlemen, is muddy water from Chickamauga Creek. One of the ladies here asked me about that mud, is, and I don't mean dishonor, I meant it as honor. The reason this uniform is dirty is because I want to be representative of what those men endured. <clears throat> Chickamauga, where did that come from? Loosely translated from Cherokee language means river of death. General Bates had said Chickamauga was a river of blood. 
Chickamauga Creek was a, a barrier to east-west movement. Wasn't special deep, but steep, rocky, low, and swampy. Steve Kennedy said whenever he crossed Chickamauga, that water was what, Steve? Freezing cold. Freezing cold. Okay? Now, this is a representative picture of men marching to Chickamauga. For two weeks before this battle started, they had suffered through blazing heat, choking dust. I was at Chickamauga in 1999, and that's exactly what we had. Historically accurate, miserable. Shortly before uh, the battle started, it turned off real cold. Temperature dropped near freezing. Had a hard wind blow through the forest. Now soldiers fumble through the dark of the woods to find a blanket like that blanket roll that's over here somewhere. Blankets feel pretty good. You're tired, you hadn't been home a long time, you hadn't eaten very well. That is assuming that you're still in halfway decent good health. A lot of these men weren't. Okay? Now, in your handout, there's a, a brochure like this, Chickamauga. It's got a map. There's also a day one. It's got a map. Okay? The one I'm going to talk about is, whoops, right in here is where the Confederate Army generally started. And you'll see Alexander's Bridge and Reach Bridge is right in this area here. This road is Lafayette Road. Right about in here somewhere, we're going to be talking about the Brotherton Cabin. I met William Brotherton three weeks ago. It's always interesting to know that when you, you see names, these were actual people that lived Brotherton, the Brotherton Cabin, for those of you who have been to Chickamauga. The Brotherton Cabin was where a breakthrough occurred the Brotherton family lived there. William Brotherton knew all about it when I asked him about it. He knew enough, for instance, when, when one of my partners said something uh, about me being a reenactor, he says, uh, David's a, a, a reenactor of the Civil War. Uh, don't mean to offend, uh, but Mr. Brotherton quickly pointed out the war between the states, the war of Northern aggression. Okay. So in black company, we refer to late unpleasantness as the war between the states or right, the war of northern aggression. Anyway, this is the map we're going to be using. Okay? More or less. Okay? Early morning, September 18, Confederates, now Bushrod Johnson, that's uh, uh, one of the generals, commanding one of the, the, the divisions, I believe, one of the corps, drew first blood at Peavine Creek. That's back back over here somewhere. This is Peavine Ridge, as I understand it. Okay? They draw first blood at Peavine Creek. Now, Alexander's Bridge, again, you'll see it in the handout. I don't expect you're going to be able to follow all through this thing. But what I wanted to point out, for those of you who've been to Chickamauga and those who are going to go, you'll see that bridge. Uh, and Wilder was a Yankee colonel and general. They had the Spencer repeating rifles. One of those rifles you load, uh, it wasn't that you load on Sunday and fire all week. That was a, a Henry rifle, but the Spencer rifle had seven shots. Basically, Wilder's men uh, lost one man in that little scrape. Uh, Confederates lost 105 men. Okay. Wasn't, uh, wasn't much battle against a single shot rifle versus, if you've seen on the table here, versus those repeating rifles. <laughs> anyway. So while the men after that scrape burned the bridge, forcing Confederates to cross at Lambert's Ford. Now this is actually at Chickamauga, folks. That right there, I'm not sure is Lambert's Ford. But see where those trees are? Where those men are lining up? We're marching down to get into the one of the, the, the fords of the creek. And the water, by the way, is real cold. Jay's Mill. I'm not sure what it was. I think there was a sawmill by Jay's Milk name. Union Infantry meet Forest Confederate Cavalry. They have a fight there. Again, we're moving south and kind of west. Now, 
I'm not going to go through each one of these. Y'all can at your convenience through the day one, a day two, and day three. We'll tell you each day what happened. And you can position it if you're interested of what happened on each one of those days. I'm going to give you a quick overview. Uh, night attacks were pretty rare at the time. General Thomas, the Yankee general, another one, ordered his division commanders to stay alert. And I'm reading this. A Yankee lieutenant remarked to another, it'd be a damn rebel trick to attack us at dark. Guess what General Cleburne did? They crossed the icy stream of the Chickamauga, wet, attacked, and had one heck of a fight. Shooting at night in those days was a real trick. So all you can see, and we've done that. We've done some of those night battles to take them out with you. And you, all you can do is see the flash of the rifle. The, the, the rifle fire uh, was not very effective. They had some hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, there was a, a Cleveland man went about a mile or so, uh, captured 300, much cannon, and uh, finally had to stop. This is another quote. For half an hour, the firing was the heaviest I'd ever heard, General Cleaver reported. Adding an accurate shooting was impossible. Each party aimed at the flashes of other guns, and few of the shots from either side took effect. A soldier of the 18th Alabama said, and ladies, I'm not trying to offend you with any coarse language, but some of this can be coarse, and I apologize. 18th Alabama soldier said, there was one solid unbroken wave of awe-inspiring sound. It seemed as if all the fires of earth and hell had been turned loose in one mighty effort to destroy each other. That's the move for Confederate attack. The Cleaver's men captured 300 prisoners. Like I said, three cannons gained a mile or so in a hand-to-hand fight. Confederate assault stopped and it was too dark to see which direction the forces were moving. Exhausted soldiers laid down for the night among the dead and wounded. Now, one of the things that at night, you may have seen some movies about this, in confusion, Confederate officers rode into the Federal line, some were shot, some were captured, men mistakenly firing their comrades. Weather turned bitter cold, folks. Frost formed. Couldn't really have any fires. Some of these lines, you know, you know how long a football field is? <clears throat> Get in your mind, that's 100 yards. Get in your mind. Some of these lines were closer than that, 100 yards or so, so they didn't have much distance between the Confederates and the Yankee line. So you can't have much out there. You sleep on arms, you can't have fires. Remember that nice warm breakfast we had this morning? Ain't gonna have any of that, okay? Again, that's what they were enduring. Most of the troops had no warm clothing and blankets. Cleveland's men were still wet from waiting the Chickamauga. Okay? Pickets exchanged fire at night. Cannon fire harassed. They did that to us, and it's not pleasant. But at least it's not real ammunition. I'm reading from this, but I want to make a point. What everyone remembered most was the groaning of the wounded. It was a night that no one who fought in a battle ever forgot. Importantly, remember I started out talking about the, the New York Times wrote an article about General Longstreet coming. They even had it bound by, by the names of the units. And the Yankees thought that it was a Confederate intelligence ploy, that it really wasn't something that was going to happen. But they really were doing it. Okay? General Hood. <coughs> Army of Northern Virginia arrived the train, participated in a second day fight, September 19th. General Longstreet didn't arrive until about 10 or 11 o'clock the evening, I believe it was, the 19th. And General Longstreet, remember, is really Robert E. Lee's, really one of his right hand men. Okay? He knew how to fight, knew how to lead men. Longstreet arrived late at night, almost his capture. He finally hooks up with General 
Bragg, they talked for two hours, and General Bragg decided to reorganize his troops, placing Longstreet in command of the left wing. Now, why is that important? 38th Alabama Infantry, Clayton's Brigade, Stewart's Division. Yeah, who's core? Fuller's core, I believe. Under the left wing, in the thick of the fight, that we're going to see. Heavy fighting again commenced on September 20th in the morning. Rosecrans continually shifted troops to support the units under Major General George Thomas. And that's another thing. On your map, if you can remember the map, and I don't want to go backwards, but the rest of them were moving south and towards that Lafayette Road. Toward the southern end of Lafayette Road, that brothers and camp. <coughs> Have y'all ever heard the rule? If it's don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what that means? If it's not broke, don't fix it. General Ross friends wanted to take care of the northern end of his line because he knew that's where Bragg was going to try and attack. And Bragg was trying to make sure they couldn't come back to Chattanooga. And so Ross Grant uh, is moving men back and forth, decided uh, to, to shift some more men up north. There's Major General Ross, uh, George Thomas. Guess what? They moved, the Yankees moved North men north, and right, y'all are sitting right where the Yankees were. And everybody just get up and marched that into the hall, okay? Guess what over here, right here? General Longstreet had massed eight brigades trying to come through, and Rostocrans, it wasn't broke. He tried to fix it, made the hole. Longstreet comes right smack through the middle of it. That's what happened at Brotherton's cabin. That's Brotherton's cabin right there. No, let's try to run the cabin. A marker at the battlefield notes, and this is, if you walk around, you'll see it. Realizing that disaster struck, Rossacrans told his staff to save himself. Every man for himself, guys, save your hide. He fled with several of his top officers. It was one of the most disastrous routes of the war. Okay? It's not grass house. Another man. Family name Snodgrass lived this house. Major General Thomas, we talked about him. Thomas formed those Yankees who had not run back to Chattanooga around the vicinity of this house. Whenever I was in military history many, many years ago, and I didn't even realize that, that the Yankees were, were talking about someone I ought not be real proud of. General Thomas earned a nickname Rock of Chickamauga because he held the Yankee line at Snodgrass Hill, saved the Federal Army from annihilation. If he hadn't done that, and General Bragg had been a little bit more aggressive, the war might have been a little bit different. It's no what ifs, might ifs kind of thing. Thomas withdrew his men from the field after dark. General Bragg did not pursue, he was criticized about this allowing the Yankee army to go back to Chattanooga where they started from. Bragg later commenced the siege on the city of Chattanooga. Now, Chickamauga, and I'm not going to burden you with a lot of statistics, Southern losses were staggering and irreplaceable, September 1863. Bragg lost two-fifths of his forces. He started out with about 68,000 men. Do the math, that's a lot of men. This flag right here, we carried in Chickamauga in 1999. When we uh, were getting ready to go to Chickamauga, this is cartridge box, ladies and gentlemen. When we were going to Chickamauga, I want you all to pass around this paper cartridge. It doesn't have black powder in it. It's got cornmeal. This paper cartridge is packed. That's where they use. 
I'm going to pass around, if you would, just pass these around. Please. I was trying to find a politically correct way to get these to the airport and all. Uh, ain't no way. Uh, it's 577 ca uh, caliber rifle bullet. Oh, a mini ball. It's about 450 to 500 grains of lead. Pass that on down if you would. And why am I showing you that now? Well, when we were getting ready to go to Chickamauga, we loaded up these rifles that you saw us here a while ago, and we put that flag on that staff out an appropriate distance where the battles would actually have occurred. I counted the holes in that flag, 113 holes. That bullet, very slow moving, makes a heck of a hole, breaks the bone, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And the reason we did that, we wanted to know what is it like for the flag bearer. Life expectancy of the flag bearer in the Confederate infantry was not long. He's the man out front. All the men on either side, they can see the colors, they can see the officer with a sword. That's the guy that they're going to follow. Who ever been holding that flag would have been shot to pieces? That's what happened to Chicken Mom. Whenever I was a little boy, my grandfather, God bless his soul, had a horse grown wagon. A wagon of the type that would have been used back in this time. And it wouldn't hold as much as we do with a modern wagon. You know, team mules can't pull as much as a John Deere tractor. But a whole lot. After this fight, 40 wagon loads of cut off legs, arms, amputated legs were hauled away. I don't mean to offend someone after breakfast, but that was the way it was, folks. If they didn't get killed, medicine wasn't like it is now. If one of those bullets hits you in the arm, it'll break that bone. And what they do, you've heard the name Sawbones? You might heard the name Sawbones, doctor, you know what it's called? Why do you reckon they call them Sawbones? <coughs> because the method of surgery back then, if our bullet breaks my arm right here, guess what's going to happen? Doc's going to take a knife, which he had to sterilize, by the way, chop, cut the skin above the break, fold the skin back over, fold the skin back over. If the bone it hadn't been closed, uh, totally broken off. You saw that bone through, bone goes off, arm goes off. 40 wagon bones, amputated limbs. That's what happened at Chickamauga. Army of Tennessee lost 2,273 killed, there's figures. 16,274 wounded, 2,003 missing, and a thousand casualties. At this phase of the war, they were irreplaceable. Cameron and the Yankees lost a little bit less, but they lost a lot too. Folks, we're here about today. 38th Alabama Infantry, Clayton's Brigade, Stewart's Division, Buckner's Corps, left wing <coughs> under General James Longstreet. 38th March, Alabama marched across Walker County, Georgia, Chickamauga. When we did the reenactment this year, we were in Walker <coughs> County. I didn't realize at the time we were walking the same ground that our ancestors walked. 38 took 461 muskets into the first day, but only 299 the second day. I'm pouring some of the figures out of Art Green's book. Okay? 13,000, I mean, 1,352 men, 94 officers of a, of a brigade of Clayton's. Uh, in two days, you had 12 officers, 89 men killed. 30 more died by October 3rd. And you can see those figures. I won't go through them. Basically, a 43% loss for his brigade, Clayton's brigade. 38th Alabama was under that claim to okay. Total of killed, wounded, and missing, 629. Now, I'm not sure, you know, sometimes people talk about brag and fact, and, you know, I'm not talking about the BRAGG, bragging. 
General Clayton claimed his brigade was first in and last out in General Stewart's division to meet the Yankees of Chickamauga. First to pierce that Federal Center, Brothers' Cabin. Remember, we talked about that going through. Crossed the Chattanooga Road near Brotherton's house. Now, uh, Steve's got one of these flags right here. This is the flag, 38th Alabama, right there. That was what would have been carried. Most people think that you're going to have a flag like that right there. You see this over here? I don't know if y'all can see it. This here is called the battle flag. You can see that the St. Andrew's Cross kind of thing right up here. At the time of Chickamauga, that was the flag, 38th, walk, 38th March Sunday. Okay? This flag was captured at Missionary Ridge in November of 1863 because we didn't follow up from Chickamauga. The Yankees went back to Chattanooga. They lined up on Missionary Ridge, and we had to go back and try and take it later. At Missionary Ridge, 6,000 Confederates, including one of my ancestors, and I think this lady's ancestor. Say it again. William Harris Dawson. Okay. You hear that? Private Dawson was also captured along with many others. They were taken to various prison camps. Mine went to Ron Allen. He's still buried there uh, where he died in, in 1864. Now, if you look at this flag here, this is a picture we took at the first reunion. See it right there? Goes again. In the war, when a unit infantry captured the other side's guns, the cannon, many times, well, not many times, they'd have a battle on it, two cannons. Now, Art and I have talked about this. There was a little bit of dispute. General Bates' brigade grabbed the cannon after our guys had gone through, captured the cannon. One of our lieutenants, I believe, was killed, wasn't he, Mark? Mark? Taking a cannon, and so it was a little bit of, okay, you know, whose cannon was it? Well, certainly I'm getting back to the Yankees, uh, but it's a fight over whose cannon really was. They're on the 38th flag right there, okay? Now, I've given you another handout that the National Park Service, when I was going to go there, I wanted to know if I wanted to walk the battlefield, I wanted to find all the places where the 38th was. That handout will show you the plaques that refer to the 38th Alabama. This is a plaque near Brothers' Camp. I'm going to read one of these if I can find it here. All right. After crossing the Lafayette Road, remember that? At Brotherton's at 4 o'clock, Clayton's Brigade, in a brief engagement, aided by Fulton's Brigade of Bushrod Johnson Division, drove Dixon Bates' Brigade to westward and followed to this position. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean anything. I had to read it real quick. But if you go through that book, I've got a copy, courtesy of the National Park Service, that read, you can read if you so sort of plan about each one of the plaques and what it says about 38. It'll refer to, you may not be able to see it, there's the 38th Alabama right there, I believe it is, okay? It'll say Clayton's Brigade. If you go to Chickamauga, whether you keep this article or another one, ask the National Park Service before you go, where can I get information if you have, if you're still planning to walk where our ancestors walked. If you're gonna do it right, it may take a day or two, but it's worth it. Okay? Two months later, five dollars is better than taking missionary rates. Talk about that. Okay? Now, I'm going to read a little bit about that. Twenty years after Chickamauga, Lieutenant General Daniel Hill, who <coughs> served in the Bragg of Chickamauga, wrote, There was no more splendid fighting in 61 when the flower of the southern youth was in the field and was displayed in those bloody days of September 63. But it seems to me that the land of the southern soldier was never seen after Chickamauga. That brilliant dash which distinguished him was gone forever. He fought steadily to the last but after Chickamauga with the sullenness of despair and without the enthusiasm of hope. That barren victory sealed the fate 
of the Southern Confederacy. One General Parker. Our and our ancestors. That's what we're doing here today. I told you what we're doing here today. That's the Alabama Monument in Chickamauga. Another copy of the Alabama Monument. Now, better quarters in the field. Like I said, I had a couple of warm blankets. I had a waterproof of sorts. Men weren't shooting at me. I was still trying to find out what it was like, but I'm only there for two days. And then I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting a little older. I still think I'm 25, but I'm not. <laughs> the older I get, <coughs> the harder it is. The harder it is for me to do some of these things. But if I'm going to understand better what it was like, I need to deprive myself of luxury. And so that's what this is all about. Not about me, but about what those men are here. Because, like I said, the rain we had last night. Do y'all think it rained in 1863? <laughs> y'all think that, that the weather wasn't just like it is here? It was the same back then, folks, as it is now. After we crossed Chickamauga Creek, and Mr. Steve Kennedy over there said, that water was cold. We had been hotter than all Hades. Across that creek, by the way, how many of y'all ever waded the creek in shoes or barefoot or with, with, with pants on there? Okay? When you did that, you know, of course, when I'm growing up, Mama did, she didn't really love me doing that. Uh, but being a boy, I did it anyway. Uh, when you cross a creek in the summertime, sometimes these people are cold. And it ain't no big thing if you're going to go back to the house that night, change clothes get out of them, but you sweated. By the way, I'm sure y'all probably getting a little warm right now, too. In this uniform, I'm getting a little bit warm, okay? And when we're at Chickamauga, September of 1863, September of 1999, 2008, middle of the day, it's hotter than Billy H. Across <laughs> that creek, Walk around camp, because again, we at least had a break. Nightfall comes, cross forms, did 99. Didn't awake this year. It was still cold. It gets cold. That's what our ancestors endured. Whenever I talk to you about that mud on my uniform, again, that's meant to honor our men, not to, to offend or dishonor them. Cleaning rifles and drying out. You just kind of had to do it. Right? But see, again, we had some luxury there. It's at home, <clears throat> something like they would have had. How many of y'all have been to a large scale reenactment? Okay. If you ever have the chance, and I'm not trying to sell tickets to a reenactment, by the way, it's a good historical lesson if you listen, walk, and watch. The stuff we have on these tables, I think most, at least mine, are all reproduction. They're accurate reproduction of what would have been used. When you go to reenactment, you generally will see reproduction uniform, reproduction firearms, <coughs> but every now and then you'll see period, actual 18, I've seen them, 1862, 1863, they weren't made that time, but uh, Napoleon 12-pound cannon, smooth war cannon, actual cannon <laughs> used during the war. And you see those things and perhaps have a little bit better understanding of what our ancestors went through. Again, this, I'm not sure that this here is Chickamauga Creek. That was the creek that we were at in Walker County. <laughs> Uh, is that actual Chickamauga also? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and this one, we had a bridge over. Remember I talked about five bridges? 
Uh, if you're going to move infantry across, you can walk some of it, but if you're going to move artillery, horses, uh, you're going to need some kind of a bridge generally. And that's what that was about. Okay? One of the things that you saw on your schedule that Art put out says, lest we forget. Without being too marveling about it, we need to remember to not forget what these ancestors went through. Some people will today tell you about the politics. Uh, it wasn't all pretty politics and degrees. When we do this thing, uh, I try to stay out of politics. Uh, the fact of the matter is that men on both sides fought and died for things that they believed held dear enough to sacrifice living with family, living with comfort. Some men were wealthy, others were poor as I am. But they gave it up and marched off to war, meaning to not return. Our <laughs> book uh, tells about that in much better detail. It started out with uh, 860-something. How many are? 890, I believe. Okay. It started out with 890. 90 men. By the end of the war, how many men had worn a 38th uniform? 1,500. Yeah, 1,650. 1,500. Okay. Because men were getting killed, wounded, had to go home for various reasons. And so by the end of the war, 1,500 had marked under the 38th bear. Steve, if you would, come up here. Uh, and uh, when the surrender occurred, Mobile Bay, Spanish Fort, Spanish Fort, total of, I think I know, but how many men are? 80. 80 men. Brent, where are you? Folks, 38th Alabama Infantry, Chickamauga. People take pictures of me uh, in my reenactment. Hang on a second. Doing reenacting, they may wonder why I look away from the camera. I'm not doing it to offend. If you look at period photographs, every now and then you'll see one looking at you, but generally they'll look off to the side somewhere. So if you do it with a reenactor who studied a little bit or you generally are not going to get anyone to look into the camera. So if that happens, don't be offended. This is the flag that the men marked under 38th Alabama at Chickamauga. It was captured at Missionary Ridge. After Missionary Ridge, thank you, sir. After Missionary Ridge, a battle flag was given. My ancestor didn't get to march under this battle flag because the Yankees had him in Rock Island. This is 38th reproduction flag, 38th Regiment, Alabama Volunteers. Okay? Hold it up. Can y'all all see it over there? If you look under the battle armors, I think this is historically accurate. Check them out. What we've been talking about. Lookout Mountain. Hank William Jr. talking about Lookout Mountain, as I remember. Yeah. 
And if you haven't walked on Lookout Mountain, you cheat yourself. Walk on Lookout Mountain. Rocky Face Mountain. The <coughs> cannon we talked about. Those were the cannon that were taken by the 38th Alabama at Chickamauga. We may have had an arm wrestle to a base brigade to get it back, but they eventually got back to the General Hawk Squad, or Colonel Hawk Squad. There we are. Okay? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, these two young men, they're young men. Uh, also, can tell you a little bit about uh, the life of Red Act. Uh, I. Uh, my sweet wife has told me we've got a little bit of time. Uh, I, I don't know if y'all got any questions. I, again, I hope I've not offended anybody. Uh, unless there's a Yankee amongst us. <laughs> and I mean, I don't want to be a Yankee amongst us. But I, again, do not hold out or profess to be an expert in much of anything. Certainly not this. Uh, but if you got any questions of me or, or, or anybody right now, uh, now it's the time to have at it. And I asked, uh, where's Miss Harry? I asked them to make sure they put the rock throwers and tomato throwers back to back because I'm afraid she's going to be throwing rocks and tomatoes at her. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for your patience in this. Does anybody have any questions? Much, they're a ragged bunch. And General Hector, as 
I understand the essence of his word were that he had marched with those men, had seen those men still their love on that flag, and that meant more to him than any pretty bunch of men. That's what our men endured at Chickamauga, at Lookout Mountain, at Missionary Ridge, at Dalton, at Versailles, all the way up to Sandy Short and the war. Anyone else have any questions? I appreciate that question. Well, I want to know about the red hat. Why is it that would just be something? Okay. Artillery. <coughs> Artillery was red. Okay. Also, you, you, you read, you, you wear what you can. <laughs> uh, it just makes that pretty gross. The best supply depot for the Confederate Army was the Yankee Army. Whoever wins the, the, the round, the Yankees leave. Sorry, ladies, we crash here. Press. You go strip the clothes off, take every bit of equipment you can. Uh, you take the gun blanket, which the Confederate never going to have the gun blanket. That's a rubberized blanket that's one of those treasure things you can steal or, or get. And uh, they strip those uniforms blue. <coughs> You've heard the term butternut? How many have heard the term butternut? Okay. <laughs> Who wants to tell us what butternut really came, what it means? Anybody? Butternut, as I understand it, they, after they tap, captured the Yankee uniform, and this is not the only way to get butternut, they obviously didn't want to wear Yankee blue all, all the time, some of them had to. Uh, they put them in uh, some sort of dive or something, I get this right, and it came out a, a butternut. <coughs> Took the blue out, but that's why you had a butternut color, which kind of like that a little bit. Any other questions? She's the only one to ask a question. I want to get to come on to the other side. Another thing you might want to point out too that those uh, haversacks cause just about as much illness in a war as the gunshot wounds because the back of it is they didn't have refrigeration. And these guys would pick up rations and then they would put them in that bag and by the time they got a chance to eat them, a lot of times they'd be rotten. But what they learned to do over time was at the first opportunity to at least try to partially cook that meat to where they would, would basically be walking around with jerky instead of a piece of, of raw spoiled meat. But those haversacks did cause a lot of problems. Thank you. Exactly. It's hopeful. Accurate. Uh, anybody else got a question? Again, thank you all very much. I hope we've not bored you to tears. Uh, <laughs>